Uh, okay, good, uh, good morning, good day, good evening, everyone who is joining us today. And I would like to welcome everyone on our policy panel session during Under One Sky conference organized by International Dark Sky Association. Today, the main aim of our panel is to discuss policy and lawmaking within the dark sky protection field and exchange the experience in it. My name is Jan Kushna. I'm a lawyer, PhD researcher and a dark sky protection educator, and I'm going to be our host. However, we will never be able to have a nice discussion without our experts. So let's greet everyone. Our first expert is Anna Baskova. Anna, please introduce yourself. Hi, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm Anna Paskova. I'm from the Czech Ministry of the Environment uh, and I'm the head of the Department of Environmental Policy and Sustainable Development. And amongst uh, other horizontal topics, um, starting with the sustainable development, uh, adaptation policy, I also work on light pollution, uh, not only within our ministry, but uh, I'm coordinating interim governmental uh, committee on light pollution. Thank you very much, Anna. Our next expert is Amy Oliver. Amy, please introduce yourself too. Hi everyone, I'm Amy Oliver. I'm the public information and news manager for the National Radio Astronomy Observatory and have most recently also served as the public, uh, excuse me, the public affairs and government affairs officer for the Whipple Observatory in Amato, Arizona. I sit on the uh, Outdoor Lighting Code Committee and the Sign Code Review Committee for the City of Tucson and Pima County in Arizona. And I'm also a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, um, where my expertise was brought into focus on light pollution and uh, public engagement. Thank you. And our next expert is Diane Turnshek. Diane, please also introduce yourself. Hi there. I teach astronomy in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I teach at Carnegie Mellon University and the University of Pittsburgh. I got into dark sky advocacy about a dozen years ago when I went out to a dark site and then I came back to Pittsburgh and thought, it's, it's all so bright, I see no more stars. And you know, I hadn't noticed it because it had you know, grown slowly. Um, so I had already been engaged in going to Washington DC through the American Astronomical Society and talking to senators and congressmen about basic research funding astronomy. And so I had been trained by NASA and the AAS to know how to talk to politicians. So it was sort of an easy jump to start doing policy work in Pittsburgh. I, I advised our last mayor and we put into place dark sky ordinances. So that's what I'm going to be talking about today, Pittsburgh's new dark sky ordinances. Perfect. Uh, thanks, everyone. And before we start, I would like to address some technical aspects of our panel. Uh, I want to uh, tell the audience that you can enable captions and, if necessary, the translation. If you'd like to ask any questions, you can also do it through Q&A, through the Zoom or anywhere else, we will try to answer some of your questions at the end of our panel. I would like to tell also all the speakers, our experts, please mute yourself uh, because then we can have a nice discussion and can hear each other. And for everyone, let's be respectful and kind to each other because we all have different interests, but we should avoid any conflicts. Thank you very much. And let's start our uh, session. I would like to start with a small overview on the regulatory framework of the dark sky protection. So we can be at the same page. First, I want to address what are the difference and interconnection between law and policy, because these two categories are being confused most of the time. So policy is obviously political documents which set goals and directions and uh, for directions including the adoption of the legislation. However, policy doesn't necessarily lead to a real action, but however, it's a good instrument for uh, raising awareness and for the future regulatory framework. On the contrary, law or the legal instruments, they can provide by mandatory obligations. For example, some countries adopted legislation on dark sky protection, which can be enforced. 
Another aspect I want to address in my small overview is what are the levels of the regulatory framework on the dark sky protection. We have the international level when light pollution is considered as an international concern. Then we have the European Union level, which when the light pollution is considered as a transboundary concern between member states. And then we have also national and subnational or local level and when we see that light pollution is considered as a problem at the national level. And the last but not least important are what are the areas where we can find the lighting requirements or the dark sky protection requirements. And I have identified the following. The first one is the environmental protection and emission control. Here you can basically see that artificial light at night considered as an environmental problem. The second area is urban planning and urban development. And here you can see the measures like dark sky zones within, or lighting plans. The next area is atmosphere and air protection. Sometimes artificial light at night considered as a pollutant of the atmosphere. We also have energy efficiency regulatory framework. However, we all know here that sometimes artificial light at night, which is energy efficient, contributes a lot to the light pollution. So we have to address other impacts as well. Some countries have specific framework for astronomy and observatory protection, for example, Chile or Spain, due to the presence of internationally valued uh, observatories. Some countries also have specifically dark sky protection and light pollution mitigation regulatory framework, uh, and they basically apply commonly adopted international dark sky protection principles. And the last but not the least important is government procurement. You have this in the United States and the European Union also started to think about the dark sky protection measures uh, within this field too. Uh, thank you for your attention. I hope uh, this small overview will provide us with opportunity to be the same page. And now I would like to start the discussion with our experts. Anna, I would like to start with you. Uh, from 1st July 2022, uh, it started the Czech presidency at uh, the Council of the European Union and the Ministry of Czech Republic uh, recognized, highlighted that light pollution is one of the environmental priorities. Uh, on 26th of October, so a couple of weeks ago, we had an uh, amazing international uh, light pollution workshop where there were many experts who, uh, who were discussing what should be done to adopt uh, the European Union legislation for the dark sky protection. So I want to talk about this. First of all, why you actually chose uh, light pollution as one of the priority for Czech presidency. Uh, and maybe you can also explain what does it mean the Czech presidency at the European Union Council. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anna. Uh, I would start with the, the second question, well, explaining what actually it's the presidency of the Council of the European Union, since many of the participants probably are from the US or other, other uh, uh, countries and continents. So basically, the European Union is a supranational union of 27 countries, right? We have three major co-legislative bodies, uh, being um, European Commission, European Council and European Parliament. And uh, the Council, the European Council is the institution that defines the general political direction and priorities of the European Union. And uh, every six months, uh, the presidency rotates amongst member states. So this half a year, uh, this semester was under the Czech presidency. And our main task uh, as a presidency is to ensure like the smooth running of the meetings, setting the daily agenda, uh, our major role is to be an honest broker, pushing for the files that are already on the table, but also, and what we can do is to bring new topics on the table. And uh, as for the Czech environmental priorities, we had three major already under negotiations, climate change, uh, fit for 55 package, biodiversity protection, circular economy, but also specific files under zero pollution and specifically chose uh, choose um, light pollution uh, because uh, we have worked on this uh, 
issue since 2017 uh, in the Czech Republic. Uh, and what we realized, we realized that the light has no borders. So that's why we uh, decided in 2019, I would say 2020, that we really need to uh, highlight this topic also, at least at the European level, because uh, many countries had already, you know, tackled the issues in different ways, be in the regulation, be it, uh, you know, voluntary schemes. So there's, there's um, a lot of knowledge, uh, at least at the European Union member states countries. So as for the Czech presidency, it was clear that we wanted to highlight the issue. And we also, what we want is that uh, light pollution would be recognized as one of the pollutants, you know, um, altering the habitats and also like putting up uh, uh, other pressure on, on, uh, on species and on ecosystems. So the recognition of the problem uh, was like the, the first main step that we uh, wanted to uh, achieve. Uh, within within our our presidency, and you already mentioned the workshop. So yeah, we had a workshop uh, in in Brno last last month. We uh, succeeded to have the nineteen member states uh, coming uh, either in person or being connected, and uh, also the European Commission representatives. And uh, for the workshop, um, we issued a working paper uh, where we mapped. Uh, the situation in different member states, uh, how they approach the issue of light pollution. So uh, it was uh, the task fulfilled, uh, having a workshop, uh, discussing main challenges and main topics. And most importantly, we succeeded in um, agreeing on so-called Brno appeal for uh, decreasing light pollution in, in Europe. And this Bruno appeal is uh, available already, if you would like to take a look at it, uh, and we point out, uh, you know, the, the major lines uh, and steps that can be taken on the European level. Okay, thank you very much for the first insight. And uh, does Czech presidency has any future plans on the to tackle light pollution some more? Yeah, well, the workshop is not like the last step. Uh, we will talk about the issue of light pollution at the uh, Environmental Council in December. Uh, and we will also formally approach uh, our colleagues in the European Commission at the DG uh, Environment and also DG Climate. Uh, and we will, um, you know, send them the Bruno appeal. Also, we will do it uh, with respective committees of the European Parliament uh, with the appeal to really solve uh, uh, light pollution and uh, recognize it as a pollutant and involve it in uh, either legislation that is already under negotiation or, or strategies. Uh, okay, thank you. And my last question would be, um, I know that um, there is not that many time has passed from the Bruno workshop, but maybe the European Union has already taken any steps towards the light pollution mitigation. Do you have any insights from that? Well, uh, not, uh, not yet, uh, but uh, I can tell you that uh, when it comes to the Zero Pollution Action Plan, which is issued by the European Commission, we do have uh, light pollution as an uh, emerging concern there in this action plan uh, that needs to be, you know, tackled from the point of view of research, etc. But uh, the first monitoring uh, will be already um, within uh, first zero pollution monitoring and outlook report that will be um, uh, presented on the 14th of December. So you can wait for this one, at least monitoring uh, uh, step uh, from the side of the European Commission uh, in, in December. And I think it's very, very good, uh, good point. Uh, and so the monitoring is done by the European Environmental Agency with, um, with other colleagues as well. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, I hope that the actions of the Czech presidency will lead us to the policy and the regulatory changes at the European Union level. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to ask some questions to our next expert, uh, who is Emmy Oliver. I know, Emmy, that you are strongly engaged in dark sky protection policy development. 
And I'm sure it will be interesting for everyone what are the keys to be successful in this field. So my actually first question is related to personal characteristics. What is the most important interpersonal foundations for achieving success in the dark sky policy development? That's a really great question, Jana. And I think the first thing that everyone has to remember that we always have to take to the table is that everyone involved is a person with a culture, a belief system, with needs. Um, so that's really the most important thing. And this is particularly true in US culture that we're very transactional. We think of things in a very capitalistic sense where we're not always thinking about the people first, but that is who is coming to the table. Um, nobody involved, there, there's no politician that comes to the table. Um, there's no business person or a mining entity. Nobody comes to the table, the villain that they're, they're not coming to be the villain. Um, and so it's really important not to come into the room seeing them that way um, because they are really there to do a job. Um, the mining company, they have a, they have a job they're trying to do. Uh, the sign companies uh, that are making these bright LED signs, they, they have a job to do. They have a product they have to make to, to make a living, to raise a family, to build a community. And so it's really important to remember that's who's coming to the table. Um, that doesn't mean we agree with them. <laughs> um, excuse me. I'm sorry. My cat has also joined the meeting. Um, so, um, but, uh, so it's really important there to remember that and to remember that a lot of the time, what we're doing is educating and compromising. Um, then I brought up digital billboards and that's really important because that's a problem we're experiencing right now in the United States on a really heavy level. And, um, of course, our preference in dark skies is to not have them at all. <laughs> um, we we just don't want them. We want them to be banned. Um, but we're not always going to win in that discussion because every state, every jurisdiction has different needs and different requirements. Um, they're trying to build economic infrastructure. They're trying to, you know, attract businesses. And so there are things they're having to think about outside of what, what we're trying to accomplish as well. And so one of the big things we've done, particularly in Arizona, and then we're trying to, to fan it out everywhere else, is working with sign technology developers and billboard manufacturers to explore knit limits and color control and cutoff angle on every individual light in the billboard. Um, because that helps us get critical information for the discussions that we're about to have on the importance of dark skies versus economic and infrastructural enterprise and development, and even find ways to make compromise. And so it's a, that, you know, always going back, we're all people coming in and we're, we're going to have to compromise. It's uh, nice that you mentioned that we uh, have a lot of stakeholders when it goes to light pollution mitigation. So what do you actually think how we can achieve that compromise uh, when we address all these uh, different aspects of lighting actually at night? I wish I had a perfect answer for that for every type of stakeholder, <laughs> um, but it's different every time. You know, one of the most important things I've done um, in working with the Whipple Observatory was to make really good relationships, build those relationships, particularly the mining uh, organizations that are around Southern Arizona. As I build relationships with them, one, remember, they see me as a person. I'm not just the fly in their soup from the Whipple Observatory. I am a person talking to them. I live there. I see what they're doing. I have to work there. I have to, you know, build a family and a community there. And so remember, you're a person coming to <laughs> um, is really big about creating compromise. And one of the big things we've done is invite them to our site. You know, it's an astronomical site. That's not always possible for some of the the different um the different environments we're working with if you're you know a national park system you have that same ability but if you're a community you might not have that same power so it's finding that common ground um, and a place to work from and so by bringing them to the observatory we're able to show the mining companies hey this is where your lights are or this is where your lights are going to be and then educate them on how that's going to be a problem and then also work with them on what are the best lighting implements they can use that 
solve their problem, which is light safety for their site, but also not lose the light, right? The big thing um, about dark skies lighting is that we know that if you have an unshielded light, you're just losing the light into the sky. It's not doing the job. Um, so you're wasting energy, you're wasting the light. And so educating them also helps to create that compromise. Hey, thank you for your answer. And my last question is related to proclamations. I know that you are highlighting the huge role of uh, proclamations, actually. So how do you think proclamations can help achieve the success in the dark sky protection policy development? And maybe you can also explain what proclamation means uh, when we talk about it in the United States jurisdiction. Thank you. Yeah, um, it is different. Thanks for pointing that out. So in uh, other countries, um, particularly um, in Europe, a proclamation might be a piece of policy. Um, so that if you have a proclamation, that means you've actually changed policy in some European countries and in some African countries. In the United States, a proclamation is not a piece of policy. So when we have that document, we've not directly changed or reflected policy in our communities, but what they are is a, this really important educational tool and promotional tool that's our jumping off point um, for educating the community and for having these really important discussions within our communities. So it is a document um, and Betty Maya probably has a, a copy of it somewhere here. She can share a link to some of the ones we did last year. Um, last year, we were able to get 23 jurisdictions um, to participate um, with us. That can be at your town level, your county level, or your state level. Um, we're also pursuing some country level proclamations this coming year um, for International Dark Sky Week. And what it is, is it's a document that shows support. Um, so that politician or that government leadership signs this document that we've helped them to prepare that says, we support the effort you're doing in trying to educate the community. And then what that becomes is a tool for us to reach out to the media, um, which is the really big part of that. So we can reach out to journalists at the newspaper or at television or radio and talk to them about our proclamation that was signed by the governor um, or the mayor um, or the president <laughs> or other leader um, of the jurisdiction that we're targeting and be able to talk about how their support is helping us to educate. Um, and so that's how it becomes this really powerful tool. They're really simple to do. And, and so once we have a template for it, which we already do, we've written a strong template. Um, once we have that template prepared and we can just go out and fill out those uh, requests, it becomes a uh, quite a wave. Um, so last year we made a little splash and this year we're hoping to make a quite a, a large wave with that and use that as an educational tool all, all across the country, at least in the United States. Um, Canada also uses proclamations uh, pretty much in the same way we do in every province. So, um, so if you're here and you're from Canada, I'm looking at you. Okay, thank you very much for sharing, especially addressing the personality when we talk about the policy making in the dark sky protection fields and the need to mitigate the conflicts and try to create the compromise or the balance between the different parties. So now I want to jump to our next expert, uh, Diane. Diane, you are one of the biggest experts when it comes to actually adoption and development of the dark sky ordinances. So I want to hear from you on this matter. My first question is, how did uh, you came up with their idea and how did Pittsburgh Dark Sky Ordinances came into being? Uh, you're muted, sorry. <clears throat> Great shot. It was um, sort of a nuanced thing. I was on the mayor's transition team, which he accepted everyone. 1,200 people were on his team. And I went into the group that was sustainability and everyone was talking about bike lanes and I started talking about dark skies. Well, when the people who were in there got into the mayor's office, they remembered me. There was a grant that some interns wrote that they reached out to me and they said, we have $25,000 to do education in dark skies and I don't know what to do here, can <laughs> do something. So it started this wave of outreach and we came up with the most creative things to do to try to educate 
and get the people in Pittsburgh ready for the dark sky ordinances so there wouldn't be any argument. Everybody would already know what we were talking about. I, um, I had space art galleries that I curated where I put beautiful space art up on the walls and people came in and I would hand them an IDA flyer and talk about dark skies. And we showed a um, movie about light pollution up at Allegheny Observatory, which just like Amy, it's really nice to have an observatory. You do a lot of outreach from there. And so this went on for years. We turned all the lights off uh, on the rooftop signage in Pittsburgh during Earth Hour one year, made a big splash, like kindergarten classes where you flip the lights on and off to get attention. We did so many things for attention. And so when it was time for the dark sky ordinances to go into effect, well, like we went in and talked about uh, what they should say, like did a light pollution 101 class for the entire Department of Mobility and Infrastructure. This is Steve Quick, who's an architect and I. And we, we talked to them and we went through it and we, we changed some of the things, but they were just using a basic model ordinance. And it went through city council with no problem because they'd already, you know, it had been years now and everybody had already heard about it. I said yes to every single person who asked me to talk about it. That was my promise to myself that I would just keep saying yes. And, and it turned out that when you add all those talks and times I was quoted in the paper and radio, 1.2 billion people could have potentially heard me. That's how many subscribers there were to all these media outlets. And so I think it did a pretty good job of like just blanketing the area with um, just the words that they needed to hear and read it, you know, read it Pittsburgh, <laughs> read it PA. Um, we did. You did a really good awareness job. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. You got to remember that. I think Patrick Summer in the chat was saying about the same thing. It's, you got to be ready for it to take a while. Hey, thank you. Now I want to talk about the content actually of the Pittsburgh Dark Sky Ordinances. As far as I know, in Pittsburgh, uh, the ordinance actually applied only to the city property. However, it's not applied to like the commercial or the private property. And also it's going only forward and doesn't work on a retrospective way. So why it is like that? <laughs> and uh, do we see the potential of the improvement and how it can be improved? So. You're right, it's just city property. That was the easiest thing to pass. The idea was that in the future, we would go and have it go further. So it was businesses and residences, but this is the first step because it's an easy one to get through. The, the politicians don't like change that causes people to have to go and rip their lights out and spend money and buy new ones. So this is only going forward, only if you build a new building or if you change something, you know, a large change to a building. Um, and it only applies to city property, but that also includes the National Aviary, the Pittsburgh Zoo and the Botanical Garden in town, which are three humongous venues like the million, more than a million people a year go to these places. So they were on board uh, with retrofitting in a dark sky compliant way, which is, which is very nice. I like that. Um, there have been some hiccups. The mayor did not get uh, elected back. And so now there's a new mayor in Pittsburgh and most of the people left because it's a really good jumping off place to be the resiliency officer for the city. And then you have the world is your oyster. You can just go anywhere after that. So a lot of people left the city. So I'm now working with an entirely different staff, but the ordinances are in place. It's now a question of education and enforcement of them. I have a small actually question with regard to what you just mentioned. What is the reaction of the new people working at the government to the dark sky movement and the like the existing or the future dark sky ordinances? We did, Pennsylvania did a, a proclamation this year, which was very nice. Uh, it was senators, state senators 
from across the state, all the way from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh and in between and both parties. So it's a bipartisan issue, which is very nice. So going forward, it, it presents a little bit of a problem because Pennsylvania itself has almost 2000 municipalities. That means who picks the light? It could be the little area's mayor. It could be their environmental action committee. It could be uh, a combination or a city council. And it's just, it's not feasible to just go one by one by one and talk to everyone. So we have decided to move it from Pittsburgh up to the state level. And we're now working with state senators, uh, to hopefully to call a Senate hearing, get some expert testimony, put a bill in front of the group and do the same thing, just state property at first, because I think that's that's the easy way to go. Yeah, I agree, because also it's, I think in my opinion, it's also easier to enforce because the government has, uh, yes, has all the rights to control the lighting from the public property. My last question actually would be related to the IDA switch. Uh, the switch of the policy of the IDA. When the IDA started, uh, the focus was on more like seeing the stars and astronomical activities. But now you can see that the IDA activities are now moving forward towards the dark sky com complaint, uh, the role of the protection of the dark sky from the policy and the legal aspects, and also addressing the importance of the dark sky for the biodiversity, for the environment, for the economics, and so on. So uh, do you have uh, anything to say? How does it happen, this uh, policy switch of the organization? Um, so I found that as an astronomer, I have very trust, a very high trust rating. Um, scientists in general do, but, but astronomy in particular, because what, what would it serve for them to say something that wasn't true, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, so people generally trust astronomers. But even, even with that, it's not, and, and going into the future, it's not going to be a, a good argument seeing stars because so few people have seen stars, good dark night skies. I, I've been teaching astronomy since 1981 in the city. And in that time, my students, went from understanding what the Milky Way was to there are times when they don't even know what a star is. Um, there are students that come from um, Bangkok and, and Beijing and Singapore, and they, they can't see stars. They can see some planets and the moon. So to talk about seeing stars, it's it's kind of a disconnect now with a lot of people. I mean, we saw 83% of the people live in cities and can't see the Milky Way. And so to, to focus a little bit more on your pocketbook and expenses and saving the planet from, you know, excess carbon in the atmosphere from creating all the energy that you're wasting, sending it up to the moon. So to, to think about all these things and, and human health and the environment, it, it just seems to resonate more with people. As an astronomer, I can still say all those things and I have trust and people listen. <laughs> I have this, thankfully, this, this kind of status that I can get people to listen to me, but I'm no longer focusing on simply talking about, but you can see beautiful stars. So I think I think it's a it's a switch that was forced upon us. It's it's a learn and pivot thing. You learn, you pivot, you do what you have to do. Okay, thank you very much for sharing your experiences for the great uh, work and peace work, and hopefully we will see the bigger changes at uh, the national U.S. level soon too. So now I think it's uh, the time for us to answer some questions from the audience and uh, Betty Maya sent me some of them. I'm gonna read it and then we will discuss them. So the first question is uh, from Mike. Technology and knowledge change more rapidly than governments want to change ordinances and regulations. As advocates, how do we overcome this 
reluctance for change when they tell us they just updated the ordinance 10 years ago and won't do it again for another 15 years or a 25 years update cycle. So what is your opinion about it? Let's share. <laughs> So yeah, I maybe think. I can maybe I can start yeah. since I'm from uh, like the ministry, uh, which is also issuing ordinances. Well, uh, you have to, you know, provide the arguments that uh, the about the status of uh, of knowledge. Uh, we are doing the same with uh, like obsolete uh, standards uh, right now, uh, trying to persuade other other um, stakeholders that uh, they are outdated and uh, we should not follow them because they are not based on uh, updated uh, knowledge uh, about uh, the impacts on environment of artificial light at night. So, you know, talking, argumenting and providing uh, creden credential um, research. That would be my answer. Don't, don't give up. <laughs> Who else want to add something to this question? No, that was pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, perfect. So our next uh, long question from uh, Debbie Moran. I'm sorry if I will pronounce uh, the name wrong. But question is for everyone. Getting meetings with city officials in the first place has been extremely difficult in Huston, starting with uh, our progressive mayor in Huston in 2015, who strongly opposed our efforts and continuing till today. We have tried having different personalities asking for meetings, but may have made a mistake when one of our first allies was a lawyer who volunteered as a concerned pri uh, private citizen with experience and government relations. He spoke beautifully, but has been on the opposing side with government in the past. In Kansas City, they were very careful to gather people with pro relationship in government. Did any of you approach your government through uh, existing relationship? This is a long question. Somebody wants to start? Yeah, you have a huge experience in policy making. <laughs> I was gonna say all politics is local first. So whoever approaches any government official has to be in their jurisdiction, has to be someone who's got a good track record for voting because that that's public information you can look that up they don't tell you who you voted for but they tell you whether you voted or not so if you've never voted in your life and you go and you try to say oh, i'm a constituent well, if you've never voted that you kind of takes you down a notch um i i find here that i've had really good luck with asking for meetings, but you have to do it months in advance. You can't just be like, I'm free next week, anytime. And then boy, they don't talk to me. I don't know what's wrong. Um, I think there's, there's always gotta be an ask when you go, like, don't just go and be like, just wanted to say hi. They, their time is valuable. They want to be asked something to do something. There is a really good, set of six lectures by uh, State Senator Lindsey Wilson. And I will put it up in the chat. It's called Demystifying Harrisburg, which is the state capital. And she goes through very carefully exactly how you get to talk to a politician and what you say when you get there. And there's also leave behinds. So the IDA flyers are great for that. After you, you know, you've talked, leave them something that they can look at. Um, for the national level, state, um, you know, it's very hard to get sometimes a meeting with your senator or congressman here in the United States, but their staff is just as well, if not better. You go in and you talk to their staff and their staff will inform them what they have to do to make it right with you. So I sometimes love talking to their staff instead, but I'll put that up in the chat. Demystifying Harrisburg, it's called. It's six YouTube videos. If I can jump off of that too, I think Diane has made a really good point here that 
we always have our our eyes on the big prize, right? Which is the senator, the congressman, the the mayor, the governor. But that's not always the right person. And so when we're especially talking about building the relationships that are going to affect change, you know, the first person to write a draft of an ordinance is not the mayor or the governor. And they very they often have very little to do with that process. And so it's very important to be building relationships with the people who have to do that job because they also have a very difficult job um, and, and recognizing how much work goes into that and how many people they're going to anger in the process of doing their job. And so I often look for who is it that I can talk to from the angle that I need to present this today. If I need to talk about light pollution from an economic standpoint, I'm going to seek out a relationship or a meeting with the economic development director or members of their staff. And so it's it's important to think of it from that perspective as well. And so I actually saw a question come up that was really relevant to what we're talking about right now about this, you know, who who to call, how how to do this and and so it's always, and, and what to say and what to leave behind and what to ask for. When you're talking to the economic development director, you know, you want to ask for something that they can help you with. I would like you to, uh, let's talk about the billboards, the digital billboards again for a second. I would like you to drive around with me and see if digital billboards are actually driving business at midnight. Are they actually driving business off of the freeway into these into these businesses or are they not? Or are they just a bright sore on the freeway that's making it difficult to drive and difficult to see? Ask them to do those types of things. Ask them to have those conversations. Um, and don't be afraid to press them a little bit and say, well, what do you what do you actually know about this and the ROI? Um, and then if you want to talk about saving money because constituents are paying for that jurisdiction, you can talk about that too. Um, talk about the lighting from that perspective. Or if you want to talk about health, you know, there's a Department of Health in every jurisdiction. And it's okay to reach out to them and say, I'd like to talk to you about human biology uh, and how light pollution is negatively impacting our human biology. Do you have 20 minutes to have a meeting with me? And that's a great first place to start, a great place to start catalyzing um, government from within. Um, so consider that as well. It doesn't always have to be the person who makes the final, uh, who, who signs off on the ordinance or makes the final decision. Thank you. It's a really amazing point to get involved, all people around, and just go to the main person just to sign the paper section. Anna, would you like to add something to this discussion? No, I will be happy to take the uh, next question. Okay, the next question is actually related to digital billboards, which we mentioned already so many times. And the question is, can we have a compromise on digital billboards? Black backgrounds, only warm colors and line drawings. Can we suggest some subtle movement as an alter, uh, uh, alternate way to attract attention using far less light? So how we can change billboards to still provide, I think the marketing purposes, like the advertising purposes, but still not contribute that much to light pollution. Please. That's a really long conversation. I don't think we can have today. Um, I actually put an answer for you um, for that exact question in the chat. Now you have to go dig for it. Um, but you know, the Arizona Astronomy Consortium has been having these conversations um, with national and international billboard manufacturers. So the conversations we're having will have a, a much wider implication um, for everyone. And the thing is, so we're talking about things like, okay, well, we explored 100 nits. Well, 100 nits, the colors uh, blur out. You can't actually see what's on the billboard or if we're getting well below 100 nits. And so um, the type of billboard matters, the type of LED they're using matters, how many LEDs are in there um, the, and all of the technology that's in the back end of that. So these conversations are happening. So I, you know, I want you to know they're happening. You can feel free to reach out to me um, and I can give you more information about that. Um, mo many jurisdictions that are looking at electronic billboards as a form of light pollution are starting to require them to be turned off 
Uh, they have a sunset period, usually from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. or 10 to 7. Um, that doesn't always work because currently electronic billboards are not outfitted with a timer that forces them to turn off. Someone has to remember to turn it off. Um, and then the bigger problem that comes on that is enforcement. And so when you're going in and having that conversation with a, a jurisdiction, and you are asking them to make that ordinance, remember, it may not be entirely enforceable because who is going to go out and patrol every single night? Um, and, and the easy answer would be, we'll make a staff member do that. Well, how many do they have to hire? Um, in Phoenix, Arizona, that's about 100 people, um, you know, to do that every single night of the week, every, you know, every week of the year. So, um, so there are considerations we have to make all across the board. That's why we're talking about shields for every individual bulb. Um, and figuring, you know, we have figured out technologically what that cutoff looks like for that, because you can't shield a... a a uh, 14 foot by 46 foot billboard that uh, the shield would be like, I think we decided it was like 11 feet wide, like in depth. Um, so, you know, know that we're having those conversations now and we're, we're definitely working on the, the solution and the compromise. Okay, great. Uh, somebody to add, Anna, yes, please. Yes, well, I would just say that like uh, advertising and billboards is one of the era of like pollution, and we are also looking at it, and it's quite political sensitive, uh, and uh, a big lobby. Uh, so I would be really happy also to learn more from from Amy and the work uh, she is doing, because uh, as the question was, is there any compromise? Uh, I think uh, the easiest way is to issue, you know, just the, the sunset. Uh, and to turn it off uh, because uh, you have to have uh, the the public good and you know uh, during the night uh, be weighted uh, with like uh, private private good and especially during the night it doesn't serve uh, anyone so I quite you know can um, uh, can agree what has been said. Uh, at the same time, uh, you have the issue of enforcement, but uh, maybe it maybe it would be easier than to issue on all the different you know technical technical uh, standards uh, how the billboard could look like uh, just to you know turn it off because it would uh, maybe cost uh, less money than issuing like a new technical technical standard. We would love that, <laughs> but it's uh, very difficult. Yeah. Uh, Diane, do you have uh, something to add on the billboards uh, subject? Um, scenic Pittsburgh is part of Scenic America, and that's what they do is uh, worry about rooftop signage and billboards in cities. Uh, I always defer all of that to those people. Thank you. And it's time to our final question or two questions, if we will have a little bit more time. Uh, the question from Dom Nielsen, what was the approximate, I think it's the question for Anna, uh, what was the approximate cost to conduct the public lights out uh, experiment and Bruno? Do you have any economic data on that? Well, actually, I don't have the economic data since it was not uh, run by the ministry, but it was run by the uh, city of Brno and the Technical University of Brno. And uh, I would say that uh, the colleagues were really fortunate that they were amidst of COVID because uh, they were uh, really, you know, they were happy to turn off the public lighting because there were no one outside. It was the curfew, you know, so they were sure that no one should be on the streets. So there are any, uh, you know, security reasons, uh, questions uh, popping up. And uh, I'm really glad that uh, this um, pilot project uh, uh, was made uh, because we were able and we are able right now show different sources because uh, we work a lot on public lighting. It's, you know, regulated well, but then we can say, OK, so this is only like 50 percent and now we have to also talk about the rest and we have to talk about the private sources and we have to decide what can be done also with those sources of light pollution but if you would like to have like uh, concrete data uh, i can talk to my colleagues and uh, send them to just approach me i think i also want to have the data 
<laughs> okay, and the last question uh, is for Diane. Uh, is there a final decision on CCT for streetlights? Uh, there is not. The last time I heard, uh, they were thinking 3,000 in the center, in the business districts, and 2,700 in the residential areas. Uh, the ordinances say 3,000 or lower. Of course, I'm trying to get them to put in 2,200. So the way that we are doing the convincing is to put all eyes on Pittsburgh. I have a helicopter that we've been taking maps of the city. I've gone and used drones, satellites, but now I also have astronauts on the ISS taking pictures of Pittsburgh on clear nights so that they can have before and after pictures to like show the world, get the world's eyes on us. And I think that's gonna help uh, the more the more people are following along this story, the the better chance I have of convincing them to put lower uh, CCTs in. Okay. Maybe if I, I may add, uh, we also have like uh, discussions on the correct color temperature, and we are issuing a new standard. And uh, we are talking about different lighting zones, and we also talk about the 3000 kelvins uh, and lower in like the lighted area. And uh, then the negotiations are going on uh, either about 2200 or lower for uh, the most vulnerable and protected zones. Excellent to hear. Thank you. So it's time to slowly wrap up uh, our panel today. And I would like to maybe ask all of you, all our speakers to give the last piece of advice to support the dark sky policy or legal development. Please, who wants to start? The last piece of advice. Well, uh, okay, I will start. Uh... I think uh, it would be great to have this, you know, global cooperation. Uh, also, we really hope that uh, the work uh, within the European Union, be it uh, strategies, policies, or uh, the legislation, uh, will bring us, you know, some tangible outcome, uh, and uh, we will be able to regulate uh, the issue uh, because we do have strong environmental protection regulation and having light pollution as a uh, you know, recognized pollutant would uh, enable us to uh, use uh, permitting procedures uh, that are in place uh, also for this era of, of pollution. So please uh, stay in touch with the, the work of the European Union and uh, I hope that we can also bring some inspiration because also the inspiration from uh, the US uh, was really great for me to, to hear and I will also uh, follow follow your work. Uh, there isn't much that I could add. People have said so much wonderful stuff. I'm so grateful that there are so many advocates. Um, vote, just think about you're voting for I think that's like one of the most important things you can do for this issue um, your the idea of listening to someone not talking at them first but you know broaching the subject and then listening not only does it make them feel good and engages in the conversation but you hear things that you didn't expect to hear I you know I feel like I know it all I've heard it all and yet every time I talk to somebody they say words or phrases or, or ideas that I've never even thought of before. And I, I love that. Um, getting people together in teams, task forces, there's always somebody who likes to go to city council meetings. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how that is, but never group, never been in. People are like, I'll go. <laughs> So, you know, bring your people in and and just see what you what you got and what you have to work with. And you'll be surprised. I love that, Diane. I think the last thing I would say is remember that um, you're not an island. So you know, we've heard a lot of people talking just in the chat, and we've got us three here today. And 
and you know know that there are others out there working on the same efforts that you are and that could even be in your own community so there could be other groups that are aligned with this same belief but it's not their number one priority but if you reach out to them they will be interested um, in, in what you have to say, and they'll be willing to take on some of the, the work or to lift you up and support you um, and provide that as well. And so um, the, when a community comes together is when you really can start to make change. And so remembering that, and then again, going back to, you know, what Diane said, listen, you know, because everybody, again, the first thing I said was everyone involved is a person. And if you listen to them and you hear their story, you start to understand their needs and where they're coming from. And, and that's where change really starts to happen. And that's where those conversations really bloom. Thank you, everyone. I will draw some conclusion and make the summary of our panel. Let's say that uh, the work on uh, policy making and law making and the dark sky protection is going quite slow and challenging. However, let's stay positive. We see already very good results at the local levels and also already in some countries at the national levels too. We started to evidence political and legal movements also at the international level at the United Nations environmental program framework and also at the European Union level. So let's uh, continue our dark sky awareness work and make more changes uh, of the law and policy for the dark sky protection. I want to thank all our participants and the audience and our experts today for the great discussion. And of course, I would like to thank the IDA for the great conference, which is going on every year. And every time we get more and more insights on the dark sky protection and it supports us to continue our work. And I hope everyone got some inspiration and courage to start or continue dark sky protection work and also get some ideas on how and why to approach the local governments and the communities. So it's time to close this panel. However, it's not the last panel of uh, the conference. Uh, I kindly invite you to attend another uh, the next session, the next session is ritual award reception and the cocktail hour. You'll be able to enjoy the presentation of IDA uh, awards uh, winners. And also the, after that, there will be breakout rooms where you can have a chat with other people who attended the conference to share the insights and experiences. Uh, thank you very much and have a good rest of the day. Thank you.